You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 102. Today, we're talking about going beyond mom. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you are thriving, when you have come peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clarkfield's Mindful Mama mentor, I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives to take family and life to a new level of peace and cooperation. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting course coming soon. Oh my gosh. And I'm the mom of two girls, ages seven and 10. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. Woohoo! Episode 102. Can you believe it? We're in the 100s. Wow. So today is an exciting day and interview. If you are new here to the podcast, some podcasts are interviews. Sometimes I talk to my monthly guest and friend, Carla Nunberg, and some podcasts are solo podcasts teaching about certain issues and mindful parenting. So welcome to new people. I'm so glad you're here. This is awesome. Stay to the end. We got ex- extra exciting things at the end. <laughs> but today I'm talking to Randy Zinn. And Randy Zinn is an author, mindfulness and wellness expert, and founder of Beyond Mom, a community with content, podcasts, events, and retreats for forward-thinking moms. She encourages moms to cultivate a life beyond mom, one that embraces the gifts of motherhood but expresses all that they are as individuals, creators, businesswomen, thinkers, friends, and more. So I'm so excited for you to hear this. I really love what Randy has to say about investing in support. We talk about the idea that our body is our foundation and that every single day, you know, we can nurture some part of ourselves who we are beyond mom, which is so cool, you know, because we are whole human beings with a lot to offer. And to dive into the interview, I just want to let you know that our spring Mindful Mama retreat is open for registration. And we have a small space in a very beautiful place at the Winterthur Museum and Country Estate in Wilmington, Delaware. And you can find out about that at mindfulmentor.com slash spring retreat run together. So that's mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat retreat and we will go deep there. I get to give you a hug in person, which is so exciting. And it's really about you letting go and we've got everything covered. We've got your lunch, a beautiful lunch, beautiful location, and an incredible speaker, the amazing Anna Seawald. So that is coming up. You should check it out. I want to share real quick a iTunes review. I want to give a big shout out to Kristen Began. Thank you. You gave me a review on my birthday, which is so cool. She gave a five-star review and said it's life-changing. She said, I've truly been struggling with parenting my toddler. I've been so reactive and feeling really discouraged and disconnected from her. And your tools and podcasts have been life-changing for me. Wow, so cool. I'm so appreciative of what you are offering parents to help reduce their frustrations and develop a deeper, calmer connection to their children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. That is so, so cool that you left that amazing review. And you know, it is really one of the best things you can do to support this podcast. So thank you so much. And if you want to leave a review, please, please do so. It, It really, on Stitcher, on iTunes, it helps support the podcast quite a lot course. So let's dive in though. This is enough talk onto this episode. Randy, I'm so glad you could come on the Mindful Mama podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited to talk to you and talk about your your book, Going Beyond Mom. And you talk about going beyond mom, like looking at this idea of our identity beyond mom and how to get the strategy and the support and the things that you need to do to, to do that. And I want to talk about some of the ideas that I really was interested in talking to you about is this idea of, well, we want to talk obviously about like grounding ourselves and taking care of our body and mind and spirit so that we can handle everything. But also this idea, I'm really interested in talking about this idea of ambition in women too, right? Because sometimes it's like, oh gosh, (laughs) 
<laughs> Are we allowed to be ambitious? <laughs> well, that's a great question. If you want me to start talking yeah, yeah, about let, that, let, I will dive right in. <laughs> let, let's dive into the idea of ambition. But then I also want to hear your story about how this came about too. So maybe if that can all wrap up together, I'm not sure. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> all wraps up together because I'm sure as you can relate and many of your listeners can relate, so much of our personal story, definitely once we become moms and then decide to do something that you know we put under the category of productive, often those two parts of our world cross over. And so my story definitely relates to what I'm doing and what this is all about. So I'm happy to start there, which is that just now, six years ago, because my son's birthday was the other day, I came to this realization when my son was born and it was this like day by day, slow and steady journey into the motherhood experience. I realized that a new me was kind of also being born. And it was of course not one day that I had that realization. It was this slow and steady realization where I realized that all the things that I had done before were still very much a part of me all the things I had studied, all the things I was passionate about, certainly wasn't like anything disappeared. But there was a desire to put it all together in a way that had a new level of meaning to me. And on top of that, as I'm sure many listeners can relate to, I wanted my life to work with being a mom. I wanted to be with my child. I wanted flexibility. And I really loved that idea of being able to create a lifestyle and a schedule that made sense for the fact that I was a mom. So I simultaneously had a desire for my life to operate a certain way. And I also was really, really struck by this concept of a new me evolving and my desires changing. And interestingly, my desire is to be creative and put myself out there in a way that was really meaningful, elevated. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, I hadn't realized that that might happen. I believe that somewhere subconsciously, I thought that that was going to be not the case. It would almost be the opposite. Like mom self comes in, baby comes in. And I'm so focused on my child. I'll say right now, I was not ever really a corporate person. I had moments of stepping into it. It was never really my flow. I had been always a little bit more either entrepreneurial or freelance. That was sort of my thing. But I noticed that I had all of these great ideas and impulses. And then the next layer of what happened in that time was that I kept meeting women, kids' classes or at the park or whatever, and I kept hearing these repeat stories of women going through very similar transformations as myself, which was, okay, I used to be either, you know, fill in the blank, a lawyer, an investment banker, whatever the career path had been. I had a child. And suddenly, I had all of these highly creative, highly interesting ideas that I really, really wanted to pursue. And some of them were in the parenting or child space, and some of them weren't. But all the ideas somehow came from a very organic, meaningful, creative place in that person. So what struck me was that there needed to be more community around this transformation. It was like, well, if all these women that I keep meeting are having babies, not returning to the traditional workforce, but creating something brand new, meaningful, that's really resonating in this time of their lives, okay, that's really interesting to me. And why are we not knowing each other? That was the first kind of impulse. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of me that had always been really interested in health and wellness and mindfulness, I was a yoga instructor for a good handful of years, and that was a big part of my identity, you know, also kept noticing at the same time that this same group of very creative, very ambitious, as you use that word, ambitious women were also absolutely struggling to take good care of themselves. So I became very fascinated with that as a concept. And then how does that meet the woman who has these creative ideas, but is also struggling for self-care? And this was really the alchemy 
that created this idea for me of going beyond mom and beyond mom as a concept. How do we take this new, incredible person who's born with the baby and how do we fuel her in a way that is working her towards greater creativity, greater productivity, and how does she believe in it? How does she believe in her worth so fully that she's taking care of herself and putting herself out into the world meaningfully? So to me, these subjects are completely related. They are not unrelated. And that's where everything I've been doing in this Beyond Mom community that I've been building is really rooted. And then where this book came from, because I felt like women needed a pathway. They needed a way to say, okay, how do I start with layer one of myself, layer two, layer three, and I can talk more about what those layers are, but how do I build my foundation personally so that I can take these ideas I have and I can share them with the world in a way that feels fulfilling, does not feel scattered and all over the place, and then I can actually create something that makes a difference. So that's the arc, and that's sort of how my personal interaction with the experience led me into this territory. Yeah, wow. I mean, I think what you're saying and what I see absolutely again and again is that you pointed out this idea of how do we develop in her belief in her worth, right? There's absolutely so many layers, like there's that foundation, that physical layer and that mental layer, but there is this, I see it in so many of us that motherhood is so undervalued in our culture and women in so many ways and the work that women do is often so undervalued in our culture, just kind of reflexively and not even very much like on the surface, but it's more of like an underlying thing. Certainly with almost like 98% of the women I work with, there is often a challenge with, am I worth doing this thing? Am I worth taking care of myself? Am I worth taking the time for myself and making time for myself? Am I worth investing in the support, et cetera, that we need? So how do you work with that with the women you work with? Yeah, I mean, it's such a valid point. And I interact with many of the same conundrums. And I just want to say that I don't only interact it with other women. I interact it with myself. I mean, I mean, I love what you're talking about as well. It's like, Mindfulness is the key here. And to me, how I explain mindfulness is that it means we're paying attention. I mean, we're actually engaging with the moment. We're engaging with what comes up. So I, as an example, a week or two ago, went out for dinner with a friend of mine who really fuels me on the professional level, on the emotional level. And I had also been out the night before for an event. And as any pretty involved mom knows going out two evenings in a row feels like a lot and oh, no, feels like a little, yeah, it feels a little heavy. Crazy. Crazy, yeah. Randy. What the heck? <laughs> I mean, it is intense though. You know what I mean? It's like hard to walk out yeah. two nights in a row when your kids just want to be with you. And yeah. yeah, I'm an involved mom. I prize that. I love it. But I'm also a busy person and I need to be fueled as well. And so I walked out the door and I walked down the street and I met my friend. And first thing she says, how are you doing? And for me, it's a mindful moment. I said, I'm feeling a little guilty for walking out the door, but I know within five minutes of our conversation, I'm going to know how much I needed to be here. Yeah. And sure enough, that's exactly how it went. So I feel like I am not by any means above that which we're referring to, this mm -hmm. feeling like, do I deserve it? Am I worth it? Can I give myself this? It's that I get it, I know it, I'm watching it, and I'm choosing to work through it. So, yeah. so back to what you're saying about the fact that so many women are struggling with this, you're right. And I've really boiled it down, honestly, to a major cultural issue, which is that, like you said, motherhood is not valued. But I go as far as to say is the woman is not valued because if the woman were valued deeply, like on that unconscious deep level, her wellness and her stability would be primary. Mm. And 
I've honestly meditated on this deeply going into what I'm doing and especially with the launch of this book. And I've really, really embraced my own commitment to this message. And it's kind of taken my idea of like, oh, I'm building a community um, and saying, no, I'm actually leading a movement. Like, and so are you. Like, mm -hmm. where are the people who are out there saying, this can be an experience where you are whole mm -hmm. and you deserve this. And from this place, of deserving it, not because you're a mom or not because you've done something right, but because you're a human being, you can live a happier, healthier life. And guess what? That creates more women in the workforce, more women building businesses that are probably getting funding. It creates a more happy, balanced household because let's face it, when mom is happy, everyone else is probably happy. And you create an environment where your kids watch a mother who is a more grounded human being. This is not like a small thing is what I'm saying. I think that there's a real ripple effect to really owning this. Oh yeah. I mean, it's huge. When we think about the things that we put out in the world for women and the energy, like we're collectively told to waste on stuff like our makeup and all this stuff. I mean, yeah, that's fine and fun, but like, it's amazing when you think of the actual capital of the money that's going into that and the energy and the time. And when we think about this idea, like you talk about in your book, that one point two million women in America each year choose not to return to the traditional work after having children find themselves with this, this energy and lack the knowledge and the network to tap into it. And I think there's also that cultural problem of being unable to not valuing women to be able to work around the desire to like, yes, have a balanced family life and things like that. So when you start working with women and when you start with the book, you start with the idea of kind of like taking care of the vessel, right? Like starting yeah. with the foundation, starting with the body, right? You've also worked, do you teach in Tensati? But I know you've done some, I'm really curious about that too, because I've heard about it. I'm like, oh, I got to get to New York and try this. Thing. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> um, I, do, I do not teach in Tensati. I oh. don't. I'm friends with the founder, Patricia yeah. Moreno, who is just a force. And I've certainly taken classes and been around it. And it's, I think you'd love it <laughs> just from what I know of you so far. It's a wonderful, wonderful practice. My, I'm not technically a coach, but I'm bringing women together all the time. I host retreats for moms in the Hudson Valley in upstate New York. And I'm starting to do them here in the city and possibly in other cities in the coming year. And I have events all the time with panel discussions and group discussions and I have lots and lots of coffee dates with women who want to pick my brain. And what this has allowed me to do is really get a sense of what are the parts of women that need activation in order to get to that next place. And also, I happen to be really, really lucky at this point to have friends who are highly productive women. And I've picked their brains and I've tried to understand, you know, what goes into these people that are really pretty well-rounded and pretty happy. And it's not always what you think. There's almost this assumption that women who are running businesses and having families and all this stuff, that they don't have time for working out, for dates with their girlfriends, for travel, for girls' trips, for giving back in ways that are really meaningful to the greater world. The opposite is true. These mm -hmm. women are just fascinating to me because they are doing all of those things. It's not that they're doing all those things every single day. It's that those things are somehow active parts of their lives. So they're, they're engaged. They're engaging the whole person, whether it's once a year, a certain thing, or once a month, a certain thing, but it's like the light is turned on and it makes for this healthy, whole, collected person. But most of us have to start one layer at a time. Otherwise, it's just all too overwhelming. Yeah. So the body absolutely is layer one. Like I don't need to preach to this choir what happens to our body. But what I can say is that if you are able to find stability and strength in your physicality, and I'm not talking about being a supermodel twig, this is not what I'm talking about. This has nothing to do with outer appearance. This has to do with a sense of well-being in your physicality. It translates into a mental state of mind. If we're feeling weak, 
if we're feeling achy, if we haven't acknowledged after childbirth that there's, let's get detailed, we're a little incontinent or things are happening that are making us feel embarrassed or like not in our body, these are real issues that really prevent us from being able to step into the next phase. So we can't underestimate how important it is to give time and space to our physicality, especially, especially if we have dreams and ideas and things we want to do with ourselves. We have to be whole physically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You are preaching to the choir for me, but it, oh, yeah. it, it's funny though, because I think that if we go with the flow, right, if we go with the flow in our culture, we just end up kind of like feeling horrible and yeah. anxious and fat and like we've survived, right? Like our brains and our culture, it, it helps us to kind of survive, but it's nothing about our internal wiring evolutionarily or even our culture, it pushes us to thrive. And that really does. And what you're pointing to is that it really takes an effort. It takes a conscious effort to say, I am training myself to go beyond the base level of survival. And I'm training to get to a level where I want to thrive and I want to put things out in the world. I want to do things and to feel good in your body absolutely does translate into the body and mind. Of course, they're not separate. So, so absolutely. I love that. Yeah, I love the way you said that, like training to be that next level. I think that's so right on the trip up that I run into. And I'm sure you do too is especially let's call it within that first year after a baby is born and the conversation about investing in time, investing in a babysitter, investing in even if you don't have to pay for childcare, if you have a grandma around or something like that, but even just the stepping away, investing that time in yourself, it's like a real block for a lot of people. And Mm -hmm. what I try to encourage people to see is that you know, stepping away and taking a, a workout class of some kind, going to meet, and this is sort of going into other layers, but like going to meet a friend who's doing something really interesting and you want to hang out with her, you want to be around that energy, you want to go and write in a notebook and get ideas on paper that there's an absolute link to the productivity that you kind of dream of somewhere in the recesses of your mind to those very early investments in movement, in good community and good conversation and in writing things down and starting to activate your thinking. You have to start with those early investments. And if you're having a hard time doing it, you know, recognize it would be very challenging to jump to that next phase. You have to start small and work your way there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Investing in that time is challenging for people. It's hard for people to realize, I think, in so many ways, like even just if you look at it from a motherhood point of view or like a parenting point of view, like if you're never taking time away from your kids, like you're not actually doing your kids a service because then you're, you're probably kind of irritable and frustrated, maybe even underneath it all resentful of those kids that you're spending all this time with because you never have time to yourself. So, you know, we, to be well-rounded and sort of trained to this next level, it absolutely is essential. And you also talk about other investments, right? Investing in, investing in other support, investing in a team. Tell me more about that, Randy. Yeah. Are you wanting me to talk about team in like the home or team, like when you're building an idea? Let's talk about team in the home first. Okay, cool. So team inside the home is critical. It, (laughs) any mom who's being honest, who's, you know, building anything, trust me, she's not doing it alone. There is a period of time that I observe and I've experienced this too, like when baby is tiny and baby sleeps a lot, where in a weird way you can sort of still get some things done because, I mean, I recorded a handful of my podcast interviews, like nursing my second child. (laughs) It's like a funny sort of period. But once baby starts waking up and starts, you know, moving around a little bit, those windows start getting stripped away. And you have to start getting a little more creative with how am I buying time? Because really it comes down to that. Like if you have a set of goals for yourself and let's be clear, like we're talking about, like you said, training. So I put in this category, working out, time to go see your therapist or your coach, 
time to see dear friends, and then all the things that would go into building your idea, whatever that is. And you have to buy yourself some time to accomplish any of that. So what do you need? You need a team. You need support. Where is it coming from? And what's the energy around that support? So big, big hiccup for lots of new moms is being able to invite support in. I'm sure you see that too. <laughs> it's very hard to open the door and let others in. Even if, oddly enough to say this, even if it's your husband. And I experienced that on the first go. <laughs> when my son was born, I was like, crazy possessive mama bear. I was just like, I know how to do everything. I'm doing it my way. And my husband had to kind of elbow me out of the way. And he was like, listen, I'm the dad. And if you want me to have a role with this child, like you got to let me get my hands on him and I'm going to make mistakes and it'll be okay. And that's how I'm going to learn, like chill out. And there was a couple of battles that I'll never forget. I mean, I was like probably very hormonal, but I was really <laughs> angry. And yet in retrospect, of course, I see how right he was. A lot of moms have a hard time even letting their partner in. Now, the major issue with that is that <laughs> you don't have an active partner and any woman who is lucky enough to have a partner, especially one that wants to be involved with his children, let them in. Let them mess up. Let them put the diaper on wrong. Let them feed the kid food in a way that you don't prepare it. Let them get them dressed in weird outfits, whatever. Like, let them. Because your kids have to be able to trust your partner as much as you. And every productive woman I know has an active partner. And I'm talking about the partnered partners. Those that don't have a partner, of course, have to engage a team even in a whole other way. So that's the partner part. And then when it comes to support in terms of your children and your home space, of course, a lot of those choices have to do with your budget, what money you actually have to spend or where you choose to spend it. But either way, if you need support with your children, there are creative ways to do it. And I actually broke this down quite a bit in this chapter in the book. Besides the fact that more and more fitness studios and workspaces are catching on and are offering childcare, there are ways to get those things accomplished with your children. We sometimes forget about the mom village and how to use it, but like, the blessing of all blessings is having a friend who has a baby around the same time as you, or maybe you've met her recently. Talk to her about taking turns, watching the kids while one of you goes to get a workout. Like we have to get creative with our village and what support is coming into your home and how you're making it come together. All of these same tips are just as applicable if you have a grandma or a grandpa or an in-law come in. It's like, how are you engaging the team and how are you getting them on board to support you? Which brings me back to our original point. You have to know that you deserve it. Yes. So it's like, it's a funny dynamic because if someone comes into your home, no matter who they are, and they're there to help with your child or help you straighten up or help anything move along, and you're kind of like apologizing in a weird way, <laughs> no one feels engaged in the process. So it's like, if you're investing in a babysitter two mornings a week so that you can work out and you can start putting together some ideas for a business plan, own it, you know, like have that person come in and be like, I'm so grateful you're here. These next four hours are going to be really special for me. I'm going to go use them and I'm going to come back refreshed and really let the team of people who are supporting you feel your confidence because then they're going to serve that confidence. I speak about this because I've messed it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the fun part of what I do. Like, I don't talk about things that I haven't stumbled on. You know, I had child care early on with my son that was like energetically just really off. And I think it was because I wasn't owning it. I didn't embrace my voice as an evolving entrepreneur, as a mother, as a woman, and be clear and compassionate, of course, kind, of course, but like clear about what I needed and what it all meant. So it was just energetically off. So 
harnessing that support and creating that community inside of our home is absolutely an imperative layer in creating the concept of your life that you're trying to build. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely imperative. And I think that what you're pointing to here, and I hope that the listener you're getting this too, is that this is something actually you should expect. You should expect and plan and and look for support, whether you are doing some, you know, looking for work or a business or something beyond mom or whether you are a stay-at-home mom. Either way, you should expect and create and somehow manage to get support in your life. It is not... I really feel like it's like not even that psychologically healthy for like one person to be alone with tiny kids. No, it's not. 12 hours at a time. Like it's just really demanding and really hard. And, yeah, you know, we didn't evolve to do this. It's really kind of a strange, you know, human situation that we find ourselves in, in this wealthy country. And, you know, say if you're in the United States or Canada or, hey, New Zealand, I know you guys are listening to. So, you know, all these different places where we live by ourselves in these individual houses, you should just know that that's not really that natural and that normal and that you actually do need support. You deserve support, just like Randy's saying. Own that support. Take it. It's funny, Randy, because that's actually something that I've been, I was really kind of naturally good at. I was like, okay, thank you, Spinner. Bye-bye, kids. I'm going to (laughs) go. Yeah, I love that. That's great. And then you know what? That also teaches your kids to feel comfortable and secure with other people because you're comfortable and secure. I think it's a positive overall. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So while we're on this about support and the home, you also write a little bit about sleep boundaries and creating sleep boundaries in your (laughs) own life. And I, I know this can be a really sensitive area and I know people can have, you know, whatever, but I'd love for you to talk about what you say about that in the book and how you've done that in your own life. Yeah. Sleep is a very, very interesting subject for moms. We all miss it in some capacity because it's never exactly the same, but I've witnessed, and I think that I would actually blur this into the territory of sleep, of nursing, of the things that we do with our kids that can feel very nurturing and very close. I think that there's a point though, where we have to be mindful, I'll use that word, be mindful Mm -hmm. of where it's becoming sort of habit child focused as opposed to healthy for everybody. And I'm really all about paying attention to that dynamic. And, you know, just to say out loud, like I've dabbled in a little bit of everything because of course, every child is different. Every position you find yourself in timing wise is different. So my experience with my first child was different than my second. And I I am a very nurturing mom. I've definitely slept in the same bed more with my second child than with my first, just by nature of how we evolved. I nursed my second child longer than my first, just by nature of how we evolved. However, there's certain boundaries and certain things that my husband and I have always agreed about. And it's not about some kind of philosophy per se. It's really just about knowing about what's healthy for us because we're both entrepreneurs. We're both very busy managing a lot of different parts of our lives. And we need a household that operates in a healthy way for everyone. Everyone needs to sleep. No one child can rage for what they want for too long. Like it has to just be my friend, Melinda Blau, who actually wrote the forward for my book. She has a book all about what she calls family centered parenting as opposed to child centered parenting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. check her out check it out it's really interesting she's just like a sage and child-centered parenting is the one in which like a child's every desire every need every want is more or less indulged family-centered parenting is where every person in the household is brought into consideration and if a choice doesn't work for the family it doesn't work And our culture has gone into another direction, a little more geared towards child-centered parenting. My feeling is that that's created a lot of the dynamics that later on we complain about. 
and have created some pretty negative patterns with our kids, either being a little bit indulged or a little bit unable to adjust to change or whatever things we might say. So I guess this comes back to sleep, which is that as parents, you're always dealing with sleep, whether it's nightmares or a sick child. These are not the things I'm talking about. I'm talking about patterns and the things that you create and you lead. So I would say overall, I've made choices that my kids sleep in their own bed, that they learn how to work through certain moments that are, you know, maybe just a little bit more demanding as opposed to like a real need. And then I work with the moments as they arise where my kids really do need me. If my kid is having a nightmare, I, I snuggle him. If my child is sick, of course I'm there. But it's, it's recognizing the needs of everybody in the household. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I mean, sometimes that's my issue with some sleep philosophies that they don't recognize the needs of moms. And it yeah. comes back to that worthiness thing that our kids are, are more important that this idea that our kids are more important than us. And that's very frustrating because kids need moms who are healthy and can model for them how to navigate this world in a healthy, grounded way. Absolutely. Yeah. And if um, your child is taking sleep from you, it's not so pretty. No, and you're not parenting so well. No, no. Oh, no, not at all. Randy, you talk about, you talk in your book and you've mentioned a few times here too about friendships. And I want you to talk about this because I really have been noticing that I think our culture is evolving away from our face-to-face -face interactions. And there's all these different benefits to having a very internet connected culture. Obviously, our, this podcast is one. We're here talking to yeah. each other. But talk to me a little bit more about creating a space and a priority for friendships. I am super, super passionate about this subject, <laughs> <laughs> both personally and professionally. It's funny. I actually, as a woman I know who's in the parenting space, did a blog post recently and it was about self-care and she asked me to write like a three sentence thing about something I do for myself on self-care. And I actually wrote that I go out with my girlfriends, like that I go out for girls night as much as I humanly can. Because for me, the thing that reminds me of who I am outside of being someone's wife, outside of being someone's mom, it's the thing that ties me back to that silly soulful person who just wants to tell good stories and laugh and you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. It's like that good stuff mm -hmm. when you're with, it's that good juju and you're with your girlfriends. Yes. Like there's just nothing I love more, I have to tell you. So, and luckily my husband and I both share that quite a bit. He has also a little tradition that most Thursday nights, he has a group of guys that all meet up at this dive bar and there's a DJ and they have some drinks and they meet up and hang out. And it's kind of like his time to let loose a little bit. And ever since we met, that was something he did on Thursday nights. And it just is that. Yeah. yeah. And then I kind of have the free pass on most Saturday nights, unless maybe we have a date night or we're traveling or whatever. I get the choice for the Saturday night. Like, are you seeing a friend? What are you doing? So we really respect that. Like, you know, one friendships are so fueling to just who you are Two, our partner can't be everything. And to expect your partner to also be your best friend is I don't know. I think it's a little bit of a problem. Like, yes, yeah. they're your best friend, but they can't be everything. That's a massive amount of pressure on any one person. And I also, the more that time goes on, I'm a huge fan of Esther Perel. I don't yeah. know if you know her. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Can I just share a little story? Yeah. Yeah. My book club, speaking of friendships, we have a yeah. local book club. It's great. We read Mating in Captivity. Yeah, such Captivity a great book. Esther Carell. And then I had this crazy week in September where I saw Esther Perel at the Pennsylvania Women's Conference. And then I saw her again like that Friday. I saw her on Tuesday at Pennsylvania Women's Conference. And then at the Friday at this emerging women conference yes. in Denver and Esther Perel and I walked on fire together and danced to like, <gasps> like crazy drumming outside in downtown. Oh, it love it. Awesome. Love it. Love it. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to, I think she's the perfect person to dance on fire with. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the dancing was on the grass, but yeah, there was. Oh, the grass fire. near a fire. Okay, yeah, got near, it. Near I didn't know if you were like walking on coals or something. No, like no, that. yeah, we did. It was the whole coal fire walking. I haven't told you guys in the podcast this yet, so it's all Ooh, my okay. fire walking. <laughs> cool. all right, we're on um, a little tangent here. We're talking about your partner can't be your. Episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, so I, I also know Esther personally. I met her socially years ago. We've kind of stayed in touch. I find her to be just such a role model. Um, in so many ways. And as you know, but I'll just sort of share, like her thesis is that we're like telling our partner absolutely everything and expected to be so intimate that there's nothing you don't know about each other. And it's kind of like the killer of eroticism. It's like, (laughs) why would I work hard to know anything or connect with you in, in mysterious ways if I already know everything? So I, over time, have realized like it's a very healthy thing as well for the relationship to step out and have other relationships, like friendships. I'm not talking about infidelity, although totally read her book on infidelity if you haven't yet, Hunter. It's awesome. (laughs) It's really brilliant. I'm reading it right now. So anyway, friendships, they're so important. And professionally, the other thing I want to say, because you brought up everything being online. I'm with you on that. Like I also have content and a podcast and it's a wonderful way to connect with people that you might never meet and to get your word out. And I love it for that. And I love social media to get it out there too. However, we are human beings, man. And like we need each other and we need each other in real time. And I actually went through a lot of soul searching about this personally over the summer because it was just before my book launched and there was a lot of pressure on me of like, okay, what's next? Book launches, then what? You know, have new listeners listening to you, buying your book, then what? And I thought to myself, well, there's only one me. I have two kids. I guess I should get more online. And I started thinking about, you know, ways to engage with people online And something just wasn't clicking. Something was just uh, not feeling right to me. And what I realized was that online is fine. It's great if it's connected to something. But for me, I need to be with people. I need people to connect with me in person. And that's where my magic happens. Mm -hmm. So What's been wonderful is since I really contacted that realization, I'm launching, I do retreats, but I'm launching the next layer of my retreats to be here in New York City live, hopefully going to other cities. And then what happens is that after you connect with people in person, then an online community continues. And that felt right to me. And I'm sharing this not just to talk about what I do, but to talk about it because I really believe that we really and truly need each other. And culture has changed. And we live in these cities and in these places where it's so easy to feel isolated. And it wasn't made to be that way. We were meant to be more communal. We really were. And so our desire to not do it alone is probably the most human desire we could have. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I actually also run retreats and it's amazing what you can do when you just come together in person and how an immersion event where you're coming together with other mamas, where other people who also struggle and have some of the same doubts and fears and and challenges that you do and also giving yourself the time to rest, to get away, to put down all your everyday everyday responsibilities. It's very powerful. And I I recommend it for everybody. Absolutely. Totally. Totally. It's very hard to replace that. And you could be a part of any webinar, teleseminar, blah, blah, blah. But to sit there with other women and feel their presence, there's just nothing like it. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is great, Randy. I love talking to you. You guys could, if you are in a place where you want to find yourself looking at this next step, definitely go out and get Going Beyond Mom. It's a great book. And I'm wondering, Randy, if you have any for the people who listening to the podcast who may not even be at a place where they're going beyond mom or then maybe they're at the place where they're just, they just have an itch or something. What are your sort of parting words to these moms? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that my message is not to put pressure on yourself, not even close. 
but to pay attention to those little stirrings and to give them room to have a voice. So I honestly think that what that means is every single day nurturing some part of who you are, befriending the woman inside the mom. That's what I always yeah. say, like hang with her. And that can be as simple as painting your nails, your favorite color and like it making you excited to having a drink with a girlfriend to listening to your favorite song and dancing. Like it can be as simple as that. But it's that you, the woman, are being engaged with somehow. And that is the beginning of feeling like she's never gone and that she has a voice in your life. And that's the beginning of an openness to whatever comes next for your life. And that's it. You just want to have a relationship with that person who is inside the mom experience. It can be such a more richer experience that way. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Love her. Like take care of her. Be the person you are who yes. also happens to be a mom. And then you know what? You're a better mom when you're like a real authentic person with taking care of your interests and your your passions and the work and then whatever you need to do in the world. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. Oh, um, yay. So how can people find your, I'm sure the book is everywhere. How can people find out more about you, Randy? Yes. I hope that your listeners will come through and check out Beyond Mom. The best place to find everything going on is my website, which is not surprisingly beyondmom.com. And there is content almost every day all the information you could want about our events if you happen to be nearby enough to come. My podcast is posted on there. There's just a little bit of everything. I'm also very much also active on social media. So on Facebook, there's a Beyond Mom page. On Instagram and Twitter, I'm following at Randy Zinn. R-A-N-D-I-Z-I-N-N. And yes, the book is totally available everywhere. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and others. If you just look up Going Beyond Mom, you'll find it. So that's how to find me. Great. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank you for talking to you. Great thank you for having me. We're like two peas in a pod, birds of a feather. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Yay. Yay. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Mindful Mama podcast. Didn't you love Randy? She's so cool, right? Like that whole idea of expecting and harnessing support, how that's imperative. That's so wonderful. Knowing that we deserve support. Yes, let's know this. Let's know this, mamas. And let's nurture these parts of ourselves, who we are beyond our role as mom. So let's nurture all of us. I love that. I love that. Remember that we have the retreat, Spring Mindful Mama Retreat. So if you want to meet me in person, come to Wilmington, Delaware. This is going to be on April 14th and it's at the Winterthur Museum and Country Estate. And you should register early for that because it will sell out. We don't have a lot of space. So it will sell out. And that is at mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat. So mindfulmamamentor.com slash spring retreat. And so that's it for today. I want to thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. You can find show notes at the website at mindfulmamapodcast.com. I'd love it if you would share and leave a review, all those wonderful things that really helps a lot. It makes a big difference. It helps grow this tribe, which is growing and growing. You guys are amazing and you rock over 13,000 mamas who are getting the podcast each week in their email. So if you uh, would like to make sure that you get the podcast or in your email and you get news about things like the retreat and the mindful parenting course, which is coming up, make sure you go to mindfulmamamentor.com and sign up. And that's it. I guess I'm sending you lots of love. Hope you have a beautiful week, my friend. Namaste. Are you a mom who wants to feel less stressed and enjoy motherhood more? Do you want to be calmer with your kids and be more present for all of your life? I'm a mom who has gone from really being stressed and 
yelling when my kids were young to be having a more grounded, more at ease relationship with life and having more enjoyable cooperative relationships with my kids. And I've shown hundreds and thousands of women around the world how to do this. And I wanna show you how to do it too. So if you are currently feeling stuck or stagnant, this is definitely for you. I've created a free downloadable audible training, Mindfulness for Moms, the superpower you need. And it will show you how to respond rather than react, how to let go of stress and feel more grounded in seconds, how to have a smoother day today and become more present for your kids for a lifetime. To get on on this audio training absolutely free, simply visit the website www.mindfulmomguide.com.